You know, I'm going to start. Start with me in chapter 3, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But I notice this. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. Now, now notice the contrast from above and earthly. So it's not heavenly, it's earthly. So it's not from above, it's earthly. It's natural or soulish and it's demonic. The world, the flesh, and the devil. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Notice, please, if you will, in verse 17. P 17, 18, peace is found three times. So peace is big. Peaceable in verse 17, peace twice in verse 18. But notice that the wisdom, verse 17, from above is first pure and then peaceable. So it is a peace that is drawn from purity. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures or lusts that wage war on your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. And you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Yet you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? Now let me just give you the rendition of this from the margin, which is better. The spirit, well, therefore, the spirit which, whom God has caused to dwell in us jealously desires us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, he says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now notice how this is connected directly in verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother judges his brother, speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. And then here is the question that sums it all up. Who are you who judges your neighbor? We come to this section today, and I, again, the... the the whole issue of this is important lesson concerning the judging of others in God's church. Now, when we start with this, I want to set the background because this is where we've gone the last two times together. We saw the principle set forth, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 to 6, which we'll review. We saw the principle applied to the church in Acts 15, and now we come to the principle applied to each believer in James 4. So there is a definite progression here. Now, remind ourselves, the church is God's church. And God rules his church. And how God rules his church, as you well know, is first of all through his God-inspired word, which is why we study it each time together, and it's the central focus of what we do through his God-gifted people, and then finally through his God-ordained circumstances. So God's gifted people are released in the context of God-ordained circumstances. And I'm going to come back to this in the end to show you something at the end. And you see, again, the, the major part of this, you understand, the leadership of the church is not on this side. They're on this side. We, we don't make the rules for the church. We are to maintain the rules that God has made for his church. Too many times we over here are making rules. They're not ours to make. 
So I just remind you, okay, this is only our response to what God has done. So with that in mind, we remind ourselves of the pyramid again, the fact that it's principle and then people, and then you understand programs and property. These are not a part of God's initiation, but they're ours. But again, the last two, but hopefully by God's grace, we keep them in perspective. So the question today, what is the principle that God would teach us. Now we, we go back, and I'm, I'm not going to turn to this passage, but let me just do some of the principles and background because you can go back. The first principle, underlying principle, is don't go beyond Scripture. I can't say that enough. Scripture has enough rules in itself without us having to add some. It is interesting. It is God's Word and God's Word alone. It's not God's Word plus something. So the principle is very clear. Don't go beyond what stands written. And we, we know the truth. This is what it is, very clearly stated to us. Um, again, we're back to this. It's God's rule, not our rule. God has made the rule. Stay with Scripture. Don't go beyond it. And again, when you judge people, judge them only on the basis of whether they violate Scripture or not, not whether they violate your opinion or not. It's from this Gegrip tie it stands written, and we just remind ourselves, this God's word was written in the past, and it stands written today. It can't change. It doesn't change. So as we look at this, just to remind ourselves what this means, God's word stands written for all time. Settled and sure, every word and every statement. Remember reading just yesterday, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. God's word relative to creation stands written. It can't change. Relative to our need of a savior, it stands written. Relative to Israel, stands written. Relative to our Messiah, savior, stands written. Relative to our future hope. See, the, the word of God can't change. It stands forever written, and it cannot vary. It cannot change. This is it, and this is the rule of God. Man didn't make the rule. God made the rule. And we must not violate that rule. So everything stands right here. This is why we do the pyramid like we do it. Because it is all settled right on the word of God. The word of God and the word of God alone. It is intriguing because we at times pass the accusation to others that they believe in God's word plus. The trouble is we do the same at times and we had not ought to do so. Now. The principle was expanded upon. Just to remind you that Scripture alone must be the standard for judging. These are all things that are on your outline, but we're not going to stop with them because we looked at them before. But here is a reminder. The only way you and I can judge anything is to judge visible things that we see. I got a call from a church one time, and they said, we think the pastor is. Should we go and start trying to, you know... Do some investigation. I said, no, 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 no. It'll surface. Watch it. It does, my friend. It just does. And we get into this business, and sometimes we destroy people because we think they are, and we judge them on the basis of what we think they're doing, not what they are doing. In this case, it became very evident, but it is how it is. But the other thing, judge only what you see and only what violates clear statements of Scripture. Never judge the motives of others. Don't ever get this. I know why you're doing what you're doing. You know, you probably don't. Because if you said that to me, I probably don't even know why I'm doing why I'm doing what I'm doing. I've said that to God often when I'm praying. I stop. I says, you know, I says, I, I think this is why I'm doing this, but I'm not positive, okay? I, I don't trust my heart to this. Why? Because the statement you see, let me, let me come back to this one. Number five, just because I don't see anything wrong in my life doesn't mean that there's not something wrong in my life. Now, now just, just, just praise God for this, okay? God slowly uncovers. As he peels back, if you will, like the onion skin thing, right? He peels it back slowly. If God showed us everything that was wrong up front, we'd all be devastated. Right? So he slowly unfolds to us those things as he sees they're necessary to be unfolded. 
I will say to you today, there is no known sin in my life that I have not dealt with. But that doesn't thereby justify and say that everything is where it ought to be. But God will reveal, and as he reveals, I must be ready to repent. But now, may I go back to number four? Don't let somebody else's opinion be what controls your life. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, I have things that I have chosen not to do in my own personal life. Some of those things, and many of them, date way back to when I was 19 years old. I have not changed. Um, but you know what? I have not imposed them on my kids or on my wife. In fact, there are some things that I chose not to do that my children don't even know because had I told them, it had even to do with relationships leading up to marriage, had I told them they would have tried to replicate them just because that's what dad did and we want to do the same. I don't want them to do that, see, because they're not something that were written in scripture and I looked at this and said, this is what the Bible says, therefore I must do it. There were just things in my own heart that I made a purpose decision not to do are you with me so be careful with those things it is not my set of standards that should judge my children it is God's set of standards and they will figure out how to apply to their life those principles themselves now we're going to come to this in a moment even further so don't let somebody else's opinion drive your life only God's by the way that's why I say we come into meetings in churches leadership meetings the only question isn't, what do you think? You want to know what I think? It really is, let's ascertain what God thinks. That's huge. All right, now, standards other than Scripture are sign of arrogance. I mean, it, it talks about the pride, and we're going to see it even as we come applied to this passage. Now, let me take you a step further than this. So Scripture alone, the only standard, observable actions alone must be assessed. Motives must never be judged. God's judgment must be the only concern. Failure to see personal scene does not free us. And standard other than Scripture prove arrogance. If you think that your standard stands equal to Scripture, my friend, you are proud as can be. Now let me take you further then. The second thing we saw is a principle applied to the church. The setting of this is in Acts 15. The setting of this was... Peter and Paul were preaching and there were visible results. Oh, God-given results. Peter didn't even want to go to Caesarea. He didn't even want to go to the house of Cornelius. He wasn't even sure what he was going to do when he got in the house of Cornelius. And when he started preaching, he didn't even give the invitation. In the middle of the sermon, the Holy Spirit came down on these people and they were saved. Undeniable. So, People began having problems with this, and we talked about this because when you see something new happening, you say, I'm not so sure. This isn't how we used to do it. And may I remind you, go way, way, way back. Go back to the times of Abraham. Oh, go back to the times of Moses. And you, the interesting part of God's revealed word. And for all of these years, they've walked this way. And now God wants them to transition unto the new covenant. This is tough. You think we have trouble leaving traditions. Theirs were tougher. And besides, they were God-ordained traditions, if you will. So there's no problem. But, but just some guidelines we saw. It says in that passage, after much debate... Peter then told his story. You know what, what happened in this meeting? They let people voice their opinion. You've been in those meetings, okay? All kinds of people, I think this, I think that. So they all got to voice opinion. That, by the way, that's a good thing to do. Hear people out. By the way, may I talk to the men just for a moment, okay? I was in a Saturday Bible study years ago in the San Fernando Valley. And a man came in, he says, you know, before doing that, I just need to tell you what happened. He says, yesterday my wife sat me down and she says, now listen. She says, I know that every time I say something to you, you have some rational and reasonable response, okay, to it. But I'm asking you for once, okay, this time, just listen to me. 
and say nothing in return, okay? You know, the, I, I've never forgotten that because it's a great warning to all of us, especially to those of us who are men, you know, just listen, or to those of us who are in the ministry. So easy for us to be telling everybody else instead of listening. They listen first, okay? But when the testimony, then Peter's testimony, Peter speaks, Paul and Barnabas speak, and you see, it's, it's important after everybody's given their opinion to get the facts out, okay? It'd be nice to go the other way around, but that's not usually how it goes. Everybody gives their opinion, and then Peter gets up and says, okay, now let me tell you what did happen. Paul and Barnabas say this is what did happen. But ultimately, James gets up and says, Scripture. What they have done doesn't violate scripture, therefore we have no recourse in this. May I say to you, that is, that is for all of us. Because I'm going to come to James 4, because James 4 is all about this. When you use a standard other than scripture to judge somebody else by, you see, you're going to get in trouble. Have they violated your opinion? Maybe. Have they violated your set of rules? Maybe. Have they violated God's word? No, if they haven't violated God's word, my friend, back off. Serious. Because this is where we get ourselves into all kinds of trouble. So, we see this principle stated in 1 Corinthians 4. We see it applied in Acts 15. Now, we want to apply it in James 4. And so in James 4, stop speaking down. I'm going to come to that, the problem here, and the conclusion. So let's look at this together. James 4. Now, I want you to see the progression. Progression is important, okay? That's why I read the passage to you. What is God's expectation? Look, if you will, at God's expectation. James 3, we talked about it. He wants peace. Look at verse 17. He talks about being peaceable. In verse 18, he talks about the fruit of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. Then the very next statement, where do quarrels and conflicts come from? Why is there not peace? Okay. So God's expectation, he says, I want peace. I just, I want peace. But not listen to me, not peace at any price. Oh, there's so many times we make concessions without dealing with the real issues. May I take it to raising children just for a moment? See, there are times when you know is a biblical principle at stake, and you make concessions because you don't want an argument or fight. My friend, you must have peace based on purity. That's where it has to start. It can't start elsewhere. So in opposition to this is, notice, is the, watch the context of verse 15 of chapter 3. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. That's, that's the, the, what, where there's jealousy and selfish ambition of verse 14. It doesn't come from heaven. It comes from the earth, the world. It comes from the soul, the flesh. It comes from the demons. It comes from the devil. You see, the problem we all face is that we're all influenced. I don't know whoever we are here today. We're influenced by the world. We're influenced by the flesh. And we're influenced by the devil. All of us are. You see, the sooner we can come to grips with this, it will help us then. Because notice of this, you see, God's assessment, see, God says, you know what? The trouble is, you're being controlled by the flesh. Look at this. What's the source of quarrels? Chapter 4, verse 1. And conflicts. Is it not your pleasures or lusts that wage war on your members? You know what? Give me any fight you want to give me. Okay? Give me a fight, fight in a marriage. I don't want it, but give it to me just for a, for a point of information. Okay? You know what? It, you see, you start looking at the external. You know what? It, the, the external problem isn't the problem. It's an internal problem. No external fight takes place unless there's inward turmoil. You know that and I know that. You know that in the times when you're both walking right with God, there is no external turmoil. The external turmoil comes from an internal turmoil. And that's when we need to get on our face before God and say, God, it does not, 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 not help my partner out, help me out. So you look at this, he says, that's where the war, that's where the fighting comes from. It doesn't come from without, it comes from within. If you don't solve the inner problem, you won't solve the outer problem. Then, so this has ended, there's going to be tension, warfare, and actually death. He says, you kill. 
And I, I'm going to go back to this because people want to my, make, you know, say, well, that's not real killing. It's, it's not that. No, listen, it's killing. Ahab wanted something. He wanted Naboth's vineyard. Jezebel says, what's the matter? He says, I want the vineyard and he won't give it to me. You know I wouldn't give it to him. It's a part of what God ordained. God gave families land. And the, and the families weren't to give up that land. That's what it was. And so anyhow, whatever. So she says, I'll take care of that. So what they did, they killed Naboth and Ahab got the vineyard. See, you want it badly enough, you kill for it. That's the worst king. How about the greatest king? David. He sees a woman. He has a relationship with a woman. He tries to get her husband to come home and go and have a relationship so that he won't know that it's his baby. It doesn't work. So what does he do? He kills him. He, the great King David, kills Uriah the Hittite. And by the way, that child, well, not that child, the child later that came from that relationship is a child that's in the line of Christ, Solomon himself. Do you see, hear, hear me carefully. Don't let it settle there because if it settles there, disaster can come. And don't say it can't happen, it can happen, it can happen. The world brings enmity with man, but also brings enmity with God. See, the minute you let the world influence you, you're not only at war with each other, you're at war with God. So you're being controlled by the devil, not God of Chevron 10. So he says, resist the devil, draw near to God. See, see, here's the, and then he makes the application for 11 and 12. So verse 11 and 12 is the application of all that goes before. Understand that. So he presents a principle, need to confront the flesh and its lust, need to confront the world and its impact, need to confront the devil. And then he makes the application. So now let me take you to the application, the command. He says in this passage, and, and it starts out with this, and the, and the thing of it is, he says, stop. And it is stop. Stop doing this. You're doing it. Stop it. Stop speaking against one another. Now, now let me tell you about the word. It's the word. It's used four times in these verses. It's this word, katalala. Now, now think about this for a bit because it's important. It is, it is said, speak against. Well, let me tell you why. Because the word literally means down, okay? If you fall down from the roof, you will land on the ground, okay? So you fall down and you fall against the ground, if you will. That's why the word against comes in here. Literally, the word is down on. You know, when you think about it, when Scripture is not the standard and your opinion is, then you set yourself up as the standard. And you know what? You speak down on others. It's true. See, if I have decided this is the way I'm going to do my life, it's not a statement of Scripture, it's an application to my life. And I come to you and say, all right, now, this is what you must do. And you say, where is it Scripture? Well, it isn't, but I believe this is what we ought to do. You know what you've done? You put yourself up here. You put somebody else down here. But the minute you judge anybody else on any standard of the scripture, you have put yourself up as the standard. Now, I am not even just for what I do, but I'm using a very crass illustration here. I have a very good friend. I will see him next week, Lord willing. He's 85 years old. You could eat off of the floor in his garage, and yet he works on cars continuously. That's just how he does. Now, you know, praise God, you can now park two cars in my garage, okay? That's an amazing miracle of God's yeah. grace. Okay, it is, okay? But, but you see, it would be easy for him to say, Don, or look at your garage compared to my garage. It's true, but see, the Bible doesn't say, Thou shalt keep thy garage, garage spotless and the floor clean enough to eat off of. It doesn't say that. Now, I honor what he does, okay? It just isn't where my lifestyle is, all right? And that's, that's, that's nice, okay? Maybe one day I'll get there. If I get to be 85, I might even get there. But he's been doing it since he was 45. But that's all right. Do you understand me? You see, now we get... So if you start judging someone and saying, you know, you don't keep your garage clean enough, well, on the basis of what? On the basis of the standard you have created. And your standard may be a good one. Okay, are you with me? 
Well, see, what happens is now you set your standard up and you say, I say, my, mine's more efficient. <laughs> no, it isn't, but yeah. All I'm trying to say, you, you understand the point. Okay, let's not go too far with this or I might get myself in trouble here, but, but you understand where we are. The point of it is it doesn't matter. That's a very rough illustration, but you have your own. I know what I do as far as my reading and prayer is concerned. But see, the Bible say this. Well, actually, I read it the other day three times in all. I do this, okay? Do you really do it three times a day? And I'm just telling you the point I'm making with this, okay? You have what you do. I have what I do. The minute you set yourself up, you put yourself up here, and you are looking down on the person you're speaking about. Be careful. Now, let me take you further. The problem. You see... The problem with these standards that you and I judge other people by, they're influenced by our flesh, our personal desires. They are. That's where all fights come from, chapter 4, 1 to 3. You don't think so? I, I, I was going to go to the illustration, but I thought, I'll just let you figure your own out here. You know what? You get in a fight. This is the way. I would like it done this way. Well, I would like it done this way. Well, which of us is going to win in this deal, Right? That's the fun of living together for so long. You finally get to the place. You know what? It isn't, it is, it is not worth the fight. I heard the, the, the most unique of illustrations I've shared with you before, but the couple, they, they both worked and they both came home at night and they both agreed. They agreed on something. They're going to go out to eat. So now everything's settled. We're going to go out to eat. They even agreed where they were going to go. He says, let's take my car. She says, no, I want to take my car. He says, no, my car. And he says, no, my car. So they both got in their own individual cars. <laughs> he starts down the alley in the back of their house, and she, <laughs> and she rams him from the rear end. He puts his car in reverse and bashes her back again. And you say, how dumb can you get? Yes, over a stupid thing about whose car are we going to take? Listen, we fight over the dumbest things. You know, that's one. Where are you going to push the toothpaste tube? In the middle or the end, okay? Even after all of these years, yes? The whole point of this, I come to you, see, it's all of, you get into these preferences. This is how I'd like it. This is how I'd like it. And if you both want it how you'd like it and they're different, you know what? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Find me a fight or a tension that doesn't take place because somebody is demanding their own way. So it starts with that. He says, that's where it all comes from. So then he says, it's not only that. When you think about it, their influence, when you, when you use set up a standards, you're influenced by the world you are. I sat in a meeting, an elders meeting, not too many years ago. A young couple that you all know. They sat, he sat before us and told us what he felt God was leading him to do. Now, God has led them. And they're doing today. And they're doing very well today. They're struggling through a lot of things physically and stuff like that. But you know what? The leadership looked at them. They said, you're moving back where? You don't have a job? You have no sense of what you're going specifically to do? But you see, and they started giving him a pretty rough time, but only because it didn't fit into their worldview of how you do this, okay? It wasn't, there was nothing scripturally wrong with what they were doing. In fact, as he's talking, I say, I understand because my heart functions the way his heart functions. I'm reading through Ezra the other day. Ezra says, you know, we had a prayer meeting. We stopped and had a prayer meeting because you know what? The king says, I'll send soldiers with you. And I said, no, we don't want soldiers because our God is going to protect us. You say, what kind of an idiot are you? A king is going to give you an army to go with you and you turn the king down. You say, that doesn't, take, well, hold it, but that's the way the world would do it. It doesn't make the world wrong. It just says, Ezra said, and when I read Ezra, I say, I like this, okay? Ezra says, we're going to have a prayer meeting, and we're going to ask God to protect us. And God protected them. <laughs> so much of what we use as a standard of judging others is the basis of the world around us. 
I say that. I am so grateful to God I was raised by missionary parents who lived a life of unbelievable faith and trust in God and who had no possessions to fall back on or reach out to. And I say to people who are raised in this country, I said, there's no way you fully comprehend this because you, you, we are enmeshed with a way of doing it. It doesn't make the way wrong. It just makes it the way that the world does it. And you see, even how the church functions so often, we function the way the world functions. We do. I mean, just one. We, the state says, you know what? We don't like this governor. We're going to vote him out and put a new one in. So we did. It hasn't done the state much good, but we did it anyhow. Churches say, well, that's what the state does. That's what the church does. Why not? We, we borrow from the, just, just understand something. Assess some of the things you believe and understand how influenced they are, not by the word of God or the person of God, but by the world in which you live. Doesn't make them wrong, just makes them that way. You like them this good, but be careful that you don't use them to measure other people by. Are you with me for a moment? That's why I tell you I like to hang around real missionaries. Real missionaries to me are what I grew up with. And uh, they're people, they have nothing to hold on to other than God himself. And they watch God's provision. My father died at 56, I think he was. And my mother then would have been 52. Would have been right. And I watched God provide for her till she was 90 and passed away. They lived a life that way that showed me how to do it. And uh, just, all I'm saying to you, doesn't make it the right way to do it. Only says to you, be careful, because many of the things that influence you are, affected, are, are created by the world in which you live. We're like the world, my friend. I tell you, this is the thing. I am so earthbound, I don't understand how earthbound I am. I, I continue to say it. Not because it's a prideful statement or because I even know where I am, but I know I am, right? So be careful. That's the trouble, influenced by the devil. I, I don't want to go there. But I want to tell you, so much of what we do is demonically influenced. That's why there's tension and fighting. So let me go on now. That makes our opinion so dangerous. That's what it is. Now watch this, okay. Notice. So what do we do? The minute we judge somebody, and it says it here, okay, in chapter 4, verse 11, do not speak down upon your brethren. He who speaks down against his brother, just his brother speaks against the law. You see, I have used my own opinion as a standard, and I've set it up to judge you by it, okay? But you know what? I've also arrogantly placed myself above Scripture, because look at this. The one who speaks down on his brother, or judges his brother, speaks down on the law and judges the law. Do you know what? When I set up a standard other than Scripture, I have placed myself above the Word of God because I have something the Word of God is not sufficient. It needs my opinion to add to it here. By the way, I go back years ago. The, the five things, whatever, I can't remember what they were. I don't think I do them still, but I, doesn't, I don't care. I don't smoke, I don't what, drink, I don't dance, I don't go to movie picture theaters, I don't play cards. I think those are five. I have no idea. Dumb. Somehow you see, God's word wasn't sufficient. So we had to help God out by giving him some things like this that were guidelines that scripture didn't say, but certainly scripture would if they could, I guess. Do you know the greatest thrill to me? I don't make it a point of going to moving picture theaters. Don't have ever said it in front of you, I don't even care. There's no material issue to me. My children never see me inside of one. I, but I've said to them one day, I'll go just to prove to you the point I'm making. I don't think that they are evil in and of themselves. I don't think the movies are evil in and of themselves. Maybe I'm just too Scottish and I've come this far, I don't want to spend money on something that's a waste of money. But, but, but that's not the point, okay? But you know what? The kids one night, they left after church, and they went out with a bunch of college kids to a movie after church, after they'd heard a good sermon by me. I don't know, after they heard me preach. They go out to this movie, and they're sitting in this movie, and you know, collectively together, they all realize they didn't belong there because of the nature of the movie. Not because it was a moving picture theater, not because it was a movie, but because it was that movie. And they all got up and walked out. 
You know what? That does to my soul what it needs to do, right? You don't need the laws. You have the Holy Spirit, and he says, this isn't where you belong, right? That's the beauty of God. Are you with me? So you see, once you do this and you make some standard, you have not only spoken down on people, you're speaking down on Scripture, and you're putting yourself above this book and saying this book by itself is not sufficient and needs me. No, God doesn't need your added opinion to make it work, okay? Let me go. Here's the judgment. You speak down your brother, you judge your brother, but you also speak down what is by quality the law of God. Therefore, you're judging the book. It isn't enough. We need some more. The dear lady next door, she says, I wouldn't mind if my husband, this is years ago, she says, I wouldn't mind if my husband said we're not having a Christmas tree. But it bothers me that the pastor is the one who makes the rule that we shouldn't have a Christmas tree. Do it out of personal conviction, my friend, but don't start these laws that come in here and create all kinds of problems as a result. You know what? Instead of being a doer of the book, you become a judge of the book. That's, a, that's an indictment. I, I want to die being a doer of the book, not a judge of the book. It's sufficient. So, you see, it's all tied up with this. And see, when we speak down, we don't speak down on others. We speak down on Scripture itself. It isn't just that our standards supersede others. Our standards supersede the book. They do. And here we are again, see. By the way, this is it. Now, let me just show you. We can't stop there. Notice what he then says, okay? So then he says, if that be true, watch this. In chapter 4, he says, but if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge. There's only one person who can set the rules. You know what a steward is literally called is an oikonomos, which means the rule of the house. You know what? A, a steward doesn't make the rules. He keeps the rules. I'm going back to Joseph and Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife says, come into me. He says, no, your husband has placed everything underneath me, but it doesn't include you. I don't make the rules here. I keep the rules here. See, listen to me. We're nothing but stewards of the manifold grace of God. All we do is keep the rules. We don't make the rules. Let God make the rules. His rules are enough. We need to keep them. The minute you put yourself up here now, you know what you've done. He will not say you put yourself above God. Nobody's going to go there. But he says you make yourself on the level with God. God is the only lawgiver. Now you've made yourself a lawgiver. Therefore, you've made yourself equal to God. None of us wants to go there, right? None of us wants to go there. Look at this. You see, we set ourselves above the law of God. We speak down on his word. And when we put ourselves above God and speak down on it, we put ourselves on level with God himself, which is the most preposterous thing. There is no greater height of human arrogance than to think that you can put yourself on level with God and make rules like he makes rules. I've told you. One of my sons said, Dad, well, actually, he put an earring in. And I said, son, the earring is coming out, but hear me carefully. There's nothing that says it's morally wrong for a man to wear earrings. Maybe one day men will wear earrings and not women. That may well be, and I understand that. And hear me carefully. There's nothing in the Bible that says that men should not wear earrings. You understand that? I know that. So all of this is, is a personal preference on my part. And I want you to understand the difference between the rule of God and the opinion of your father. But it just so happens that I am the one who heads up this home. And therefore, you're not going to wear it, okay? And because the Bible says you must honor me, therefore, this is what you're going to have to do. But I want you to understand, it's my opinion, not his opinion. Are you with me? Make a distinction between the two. Understand that there is a difference. Now, if he wants to wear a ring today, it's his business, not mine. But uh, back then, it was a different story. But you see here, look at this. See, this is what we have done. See, we're over here. We don't make the rules. He makes the rules. But we over here, we try to make rules. We're not here to make rules. We're only here to make sure that we keep his rules. It's the only job we have. If you violate the clear statement of God, 
If you commit adultery, I know you're not supposed to because God says so. You're not violating, violating my opinion, you're violating his. Therefore, I will come and talk to you and say you're wrong. Because I think so? No, because he thinks so. Are you with me? So therefore, there is the distinction. We don't make the rules. We only maintain them. <laughs> I sat down with a dear lady one day that you all know, and I, I said to her, I said, you know, I love you dearly, but you know what? I just got to tell you, scripture-wise, in this area, you're violating the word of God. And... Um, I had to do that. But see, it wasn't violating my opinion, see. And uh, it just, it's, it was one of the tough things to do because with my wife, it's easier. But somebody else's wife is a little tougher. But it still has to be not because you violate what I think you're violating, what he thinks. And by the way, we need to be careful. When God makes the rules, we start extrapolating stuff from that, and then we start judging people by our extrapolation. Stick with the text. Don't start stretching it out as far as you want it to go. And we do that. Now, I must conclude. Watch this, if you will. So stop speaking down. The problem is we place ourselves above others, place ourselves above God's word, we place ourselves in love with God. The conclusion. Well, who are you? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to do it? That's the summation of this whole passage. Who in the world are we to think that we're in a position to pass judgment on anybody else? It's not my role. Just a reminder to us, my friend, is so easy to do. Understand how influenced we all are by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and it does get into us. Be careful. So when we get into it, we step back and say, you know what, I don't demand my rights or my opinion to be kept here. That'll settle most fights right there. I'm not going to let the influence of the world do it. I'm not going to let the devil get in here and start a fight when there shouldn't be one. I'm not going to do that. So by God's grace, stop speaking down to one another, my brother. For he who speaks down his brother and judges his brother speaks down the law and judges the law. And who in the world is it made you the lawgiver? There's only one who is God himself. So who are we to judge?